Now, when you do an experiment, um, you usually want to uh, separate your participants into at least two different groups. So, for example, if, we were, if we're doing this experiment trying to see whether a diet type causes, uh, you know, vegetarian diet causes poor health, uh, we would at least want to have two groups. We'd want to have one group getting a vegetarian diet and one group getting some kind of diet to compare that with. So the terminology we use here is this. We say the one group is the experimental group. This is the group that gets the treatment. This is the group that, that gets, we, we give the independent variable. We change the, the variable to, to being a vegetarian diet in this group, and we see if this has an effect. But we have to have something to compare this to, so we also have a control group. And the definition here is that the control group is, is exactly the same as the experimental group, except that it doesn't get the treatment. So uh, if, if the one group is getting a vegetarian diet, the other group, we want it to be as close to the same as possible other than having a different diet. Um, if, if the groups are different in other ways, then that's a serious problem. So for example, suppose that in addition to the one group getting a vegetarian diet, we also happened to grab younger people for that group. Well, now we have young people getting a vegetarian diet and older people getting some other kind of diet. Um, well, when we see the results, um, was the change in their health outcomes, was that caused by, uh, by the fact that they got this particular diet, or was it caused by their age? And we don't know. The results are all mixed up. The effects are mixed up, and, and thus we have age, in that case, would be a confounding variable. Um, again, confounding mean, meaning that the, the results the, or the effects are all mixed up or all confounded together, and you can't disentangle them. You can't tell what's causing what. So we need to rule that kind of stuff out by making sure that the two groups at the beginning of the experiment are exactly the same. So uh, if we look at, uh, a, 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 let's take a different experiment, and this experiment will we'll go with a very silly one. We want to change people's height. We have a, a shrink ray that we've developed, or at least we hope it's a shrink ray. And so we are going to uh, point it at some people and see if we can shrink them. Uh, but we have to start off with people in the experimental group. The experimental group are the ones who are going to get the shrink ray. And the control group, those are the other participants, they have to start off with the same height. So before the experiment, we want the height to be the same. We want the groups to be exactly the same if possible. And then after the experiment, when we see that the experimental group is indeed shorter, we can be confident that this change this uh, effect was caused by the independent variable by our shrink ray, okay? So the ideal is we start off with an experimental group and a control group that are exactly the same, then we give the experimental group the treatment and that makes it different from the control group and we know that difference is caused by our independent variable. So when you're doing this kind of, of thing with experiments, one of the important issues that comes up is how you decide uh, which people go in each of these groups, which people go in the experimental group and which people go in the control group, because you've got a group of people and you have to decide how to split them up. This matters because, you know, let's say we have this big uh, group of people who've all volunteered to be uh, in our experiment, and they've got all kinds of diverse characteristics, different heights, and some of them seem to be dancing, but you, you take some of the people and you put them in one group. What if when you pick the people for this one group, you, uh, you allow your, your biases to influence how you're selecting. And, and you're not really aware of this, but because this is the shrink ray group, you sort of unconsciously pick shorter people for this group. So you end up with an average height of like four feet, five inches in this group. And then when you grab people for the other group, you uh, subconsciously grab a, a bunch of taller people. And so you end up with an average height of six feet, five inches. Well, this is a big problem because before the experiment has even begun, you've now got uh, a very big difference between the groups um, just because of your biased selection or biased assignment in the way that you put the people in this group. And again, the, the reason why that's a problem is because this is what things will look like before your experiment has even begun. You'll get this big difference between groups. Now, we don't usually see this, so we aren't aware that this has happened because we didn't measure all the heights of everyone in our experiment. And then we just see what happens after the experiment and we say, well, the group that got the shrink ray, they're much shorter than the control group. But of course, this wasn't really a control group because it didn't start off being the same. Again, a control group's only a control group if it's, it starts off by being exactly the same as the experimental group and then you just change the one thing, the treatment that the experimental group is, is, is given. So 
how are we going to solve this issue? Well, you certainly could measure what your participants were like at the beginning of the study, but that's not always the best way to do it because uh, sometimes you have a lot of different variables that you care about. So you, in this case, it would be pretty easy to just measure the, the participant's height. But let's say, for example, we, were, uh, we had uh, some people with an illness and we were trying to decrease how sick they were by giving them some treatment. Well, they could have a, a, a different level of, Ill, of the illness. They, some people could be sicker, some people, people could be less sick. So we wanna make sure they're the same level of sickness in both groups. But some people could also have a, a, a healthier immune system or be eating a better diet. So there's all kinds of ways in which they could be different. And we wanna rule out any kind of biased selection that might uh, come into play. So the easiest, sort of cheapest uh, way to, to efficiently rule out that kind of biased assignment is to use, instead of biased assignment, just do the assignment totally randomly. So this is another example of a system that you can put in place in science that rules, takes, takes your biases out and makes sure that your biases aren't influencing the results. So if you are just flipping a coin, you know, the participant walks up and you flip a coin and you go, wow, you got heads, that means they go in the experimental group. Tails, it means they go in the control group. Then you're not going to get a big difference between the groups. You're going to end up with groups that are about the same. So you, you will have differences in different things, um, you, you know, like, like the height or like their immune system or like their diet. But on average, the, the average uh, characteristics, like the average height of this group, will end up being about the same as the average height of the other group. So even though there may be differences between members of the two groups, if you do in, uh, enough participants in each group, the averages will be about the same. Now, uh, one of the issues that comes up there is, like I said, you have to have enough participants in each group. So if you just picked one or two participants, there's a decent chance that you happen to grab, even with random assignment, you happen to grab two really tall guys for this group and two really short guys for this group or the other way around. Um, so you want to have some reasonable number of, of participants to make sure that the averages are gonna come out about the same. And obviously the more participants you have, the, the closer these averages are likely to be. And if you really wanted to be sure they were the same, when you, you could go up to something like a thousand participants, um, and then these averages are gonna be darn near identical. But that's not really usually necessary and it's a lot more expensive. So even with a relatively small group, like five or 10 people, you usually start to get pretty close to the same uh, average uh, level on, on, on whatever it is you're looking at. And that means that you're going to start off your experiment with the two groups being about the same. So when you do, uh, when you do the experiment then, if one of them ends up being different in the end of the experiment, you didn't have to look at it, you didn't have to measure them in the beginning, um, you know that if there's some difference, that, that difference was caused by your treatment, okay? And so to repeat something actually that I was talking about a minute ago, uh, make it a little bit clearer, the idea is not just that random assignment leads the groups to be about the same on one thing, but it, it tends to make them the same on every characteristic that they could possibly have. So uh, this is one of the reasons why doing random assignment is so efficient and so cost effective. So if we go back again to the idea, uh, instead of measuring height this time, we're going to look at some people who have some kind of illness and we come up with new, so a new experimental treatment, a medicine to, to help make them less sick, we hope. Um, so what we want is, first of all, we want them to have about the same level of, of the illness. We don't want people who are really sick or, or, or not very sick in one group and, and very a big difference between these two when we start. So we want illness to be about the same. And so we could just measure the, the level to which they're ill at the beginning of the experiment to see if it's the same. But there are other things we care about as well. Like we, we would want their immune systems to be about the same. So even if they're the same, you know, the, the, the level to which they're sick is the same at the beginning of the experiment. If the people in the experimental group have a really, really healthy immune system, well, that's gonna cause a problem because we don't know, this is a, this is a confounding variable again. We don't know if they get less sick because of their immune system or if they get less sick because of the treatment. But the nice thing with random assignment is not only are the groups the same in terms of how sick they are, but because they were randomly assigned, we, we can know without even checking that they're going to be about the same in terms of their average 
uh, the average quality of their immune system, and they're going to be about the, so the same in terms of uh, what kind of diet they have on average. You know, some people in this diet will have, or in this group will have a good diet, some people will have a bad diet, and some people in this group will have a good diet and a bad diet. But the point is, any differences, if we're picking enough, a reasonable number of people for each group randomly, then any differences will tend to equalize out and we'll get about the same average uh, uh, level on, on whatever that variable is between the groups. So random assignment is sort of the great equalizer of everything between the two groups, as long as you, you have enough participants, uh, you know, a reasonable number of participants in each group.